are already in here. So good, good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us today at the Experts Webinar Innovation at Unica. My name is Gonzalo Mott and I'll be your host today. This event promoted by Nova and Unica is part of, of a series of preparatory webinars specially conceived to support you on your journey until the main conference. In this webinar, you will have a unique opportunity to engage with the views of two renowned experts in the area of higher education and hopefully leave with more questions than answers for further autonomous work. Just a few notes concerning the webinar. This webinar will be fully recorded for further disclosure and it will be divided in two parts. The first part where our keynote speakers will make a brief presentation then after a short break, a virtual roundtable where those teams will be a bit more developed. During the, the virtual roundtable, you may submit questions by chat, and the moderator may include some of those questions in the discussion. And please, to avoid background noise, please keep your microphones off during all the webinar. With that said, before I do introduce our renowned experts, Professor Sublek from Lancaster University and Professor Peretz Lavi from Technion, Israel Institute of Technology, I'm pleased to announce that we have with us today the Vice Rector of Nova University Lisbon, Professor Amar Matus, and the President of Unica, Professor Luciano Sasso, who kindly accepted the invitation to welcome and open the webinar. So I'll start by giving the floor to the Vice Rector of Nova University Lisbon, Professor Amar Matos. The screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gonzalo. Thank you and, uh, and welcome to all of you. So this is um, an initiative that Nova is proud to host together with the UNICA, the network of uh, European capital universities. And uh, I just made a point of uh, making an introductory uh, note to thank uh, very warmly uh, both Professor Sublak from the University of Lancaster and Peretz Lavi, the former president of Technion, for their participation. I think it's, it's an honor to all of us and a privilege to uh, actually have the opportunity of sharing your thoughts with, with us and with all the students present in this conference. I just wanted to make sure that this thank you note was was given uh, since I, I addressed personally the invitation to, to, to join us. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much, Professor. I'll not now give the floor to Professor Luciano Sasso. Thank you, Professor. The screen is yours. So uh, hello to everyone. It is a great pleasure for me to be here. Uh, many thanks uh, to the University of Nova de Lisboa for hosting this webinar and for organizing the Student Conference 2021. This is a very important uh, event uh, for UNICA. We organize the Student Conference every two or three years, usually in person. Unfortunately, due to the COVID uh, pandemics, uh, we have to move uh, completely online uh, the conference this year. I know students are quite uh, sad about that and disappointed, but we tried uh, to have a, a, you know, a, a different format for uh, the Student Conference this year to try at least in part to compensate the lack of interaction that usually uh, takes place uh, in the student conference in person with a series of webinars to actually allow students to prepare very well in view of the final event, which will take place uh, digitally between the 19th and 21st of July. So we had some uh, warm up webinars with the uh, students uh, you know, discussing among themselves about different topics. And today we have a very high level webinar you know, uh, that uh, will be very useful, I think, for students uh, to, to prepare for, for the final event. I want to thank uh, very much uh, Professor Amaro De Matos. I want to thank very much uh, Gonzalo Mota for the organization of this webinar. And the two uh, distinguished uh, speakers, uh, Professor Black, who will give a talk on a very important topic, which is the importance of a civic engagement for a modern university. And uh, Professor Levy, who will give a talk on the 21st century innovation, a key to unlocking cities' economic growth, the role of university. This is really uh, you know, very important for UNICA, very important for this uh, conference. Let me also thank the moderator of the session, uh, Professor Luis Baptista from NOVA. And uh, I wish uh, all the participants and a very pleasant and very fruitful event. Thank you so much, Professor. We just had uh, a small change of plans. We will have um, Professor João Martin Matos, our Vice Director, as the moderator. Unfortunately, Professor Luis Batista could not be with, with us today. Um, and now we'll start with the, the first part of the webinar. So I will now introduce our first keynote speaker, Professor Dan Black, Pro Vice Chancellor for Engagement at Lancaster University. <laughs> 
Professor Black is a leading anatomist and forensic anthropologist. She leads on developing the university culture of engagement, working at local, regional, national, and international levels to shape the university's engagement strategy. Her research portfolio has secured over 22 million pounds of funding, and she is the author of 14 textbooks in excess of 150 peer review publications. She is also the author of the best selling book, All That Remains. Most recently, Professor Black took up the cross bench seat in the House of Lords as Baroness Black of Strom. Professor Black, thank you again for accepting this challenge. And please, the virtual stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you for inviting me. It is a tremendous pleasure. Of course, I'd much rather be in Lisbon at the moment. The northwest of England is very cold and very wet. But I'll do my best to bring a little bit of UK sunshine, I hope, to the next 10 minutes or so. And what I'm going to try and do is share my screen with you. And I just have one or two slides that just sort of help me to, to keep, keep myself in, in time. And I'm hoping that you can see that slide quite clearly. Somebody would just give me a nod. Yes, we can see. Thank you very much indeed. That's very kind of you. Can you just try to put in the slideshow in the display settings? I have done. I think it's probably because I have a double screen that might be... Okay, so that's okay also like this. Thank you very much. Sure. Oh, thank you. You're so very kind. Um, there are three pillars to Lancaster University. It is its research, its uh, education and its engagement. And those three pillars have been the three pillars since the uh, instigation of the university back in the early 1960s. And really in the post-COVID era, and as we move into an era of considerable change, we've identified that the engagement element of our pillars is probably the most agile and the most flexible that allows us to, to seek opportunities and to uh, allow those opportunities to flourish. So for example, engagement um, links very closely with research into a research enterprise, an engagement uh, partition, but also into teaching, into a teaching enterprise and engagement. And when you start to create the bridges between these pillars, that's where the real magic happens and the real change that we hope will occur. So when you look at, at what was an original but very dated perspective of what a civic university looked like, and this was a civic university being described in the UK, it was what was considered one of the modern universities, which would have been founded in the early 19th century, whose prime purpose was for the education of the middle class youth, but predominantly the male middle class youth, and therefore usually non-residential and situated in a large city. And that was what was a summary of what was a civic university. And in the UK over the last two years, we set up something that's called the Civic Universities Agreement, and the universities have been signing up to that, understanding that if they are an anchor institution within their region, then they have a responsibility. They have a responsibility not only to run their own business effectively, because they are major employers in the area, but also to become the facilitators who are able to bring together different parties to generate opportunities for a locality and for a region. And so today, what our view of a civic university is, is that it is an academic institution that is based within place, because you really are going to understand the geographical environment in which a university is placed better than anybody else. But our role is to connect with our local area and communities, not connect to them. And there's a very important distinction between that. It's about partnership, working with somebody, listening to what their needs are, as well as our own. And in doing that, we have to learn to understand how we can interact with those local communities. And when we interact with them, what is the impact on those different communities? And in that partnership, what we want to explore is what we can do with our local area and our communities to become a positive driver for change. And that change may be at an economic level, it may be at a social level, it may be about well-being. So there's a huge responsibility starting to really focus around universities that I think has always been there, but there has been a change of lens that says we're not just here to undertake the high-level research or to teach our undergraduate or our postgraduate students, 
but we have a civic responsibility within our communities. And how do we maximise on that? And it's really quite a change of perspective for some aspects of the UK. When we look at that role that we've played as a civic university, particularly in relation to the COVID era, we started to see a number of areas in which we've really been able to take a leadership role and that leadership may be to actually lead on projects, but it could also be to bring people together to allow a project to succeed that wouldn't have happened if you hadn't taken that chair position at the table. Now, Lancaster is an unusual university in that it is a triple top 10 league table university that is uh, research intensive, in, intensive, but we're also in a, a relatively remote part of the UK. We're in the Northwest, but we're somewhere between Liverpool and Glasgow. So not in an area of particularly high population and quite rural in some regards. And to have a rural university that is in that top 10 league table position is unusual. And the experiences that we have as a civic university can be very different and much more challenging than some of our larger universities, for example, who are based in our urban environments. But certainly during the COVID time, we find that what we're able to do, because people are now so much more willing to find ways to work together and to feel less threatened by the kind of technology that we have in front of us, is to become much more creative about how we facilitate the partnerships and the networks. Sometimes it feels like a bit of a dating agency, you know, the university equivalent of Tinder or whatever it may be, that you can bring people together around a virtual table to start to create networks that you may no longer become a part of, but you know that you're setting up something that you hope will take opportunities forward. And being a top 10 university, it gives us that convening capability, access into government, access into agencies that perhaps smaller universities might not have. And that has a significant impact on the, the position of a university and its ability to influence its region. We've seen throughout COVID a huge amount of repurposing of our equipment and our facilities, making our laboratories available for testing, making it available for vaccinations, sending our equipment halfway around the country with the vague hope and our fingers crossed that it will find its way back to us, simply because in those early stages there was so much cutting edge research that needed to be done, that the country needed to pull its resources. And we're able to do that because of our convening power and the utilisation of our consumables and our manufacturing capability so that we were able to create the PPE that was required on campus and be able to distribute that around, for example, to our NHS and to our care providers, but also to bring together manufacturers who would normally, under normal circumstances, make entirely different things, like um, we have a, a distillery very close by that makes artisan gin. They stopped brewing gin, which I think is rather a bit of a shame, and started creating hand sanitizer. It's just alcohol in another form. So being able to repurpose that manufacturing capability, even for just a short space of time, is a real energy boost and it brings different partners together. It also allowed us to look at the resources of our skills and our expertise, being able to make our scientists available out to business, out to the community and out to government to say how can we help through not only the COVID period, but importantly through the recovery period as well. And supporting our businesses, businesses that were so badly hit over the last 18 months, how can we help to bring them forward? How can we make sure they have the resources they need to survive that period? And many haven't, unfortunately, but we do want to be able to help them as they come out of the COVID period into recovery, making their businesses stronger and more effective. And then that huge local community support is also incredibly important when locally there was a real feeling that the university was behind that recovery process and that management process. So these all sound sort of terribly nebulous and they sound a little bit gray and they're not very exciting. They are terribly important. But I want to give you, just in the last couple of slides, something that I think is really exciting. Something that shows you what happens when 
you have an anchor institution like a university. You have private companies that have these wacky ideas and you wrap around them um, a group of civic partners whose sole purpose is to make a project work, not for their financial benefit, but for the benefit of the community. So let me talk to you very quickly about the Eden Project North. So I don't know if any of you have been to Cornwall in the UK and the Eden Project with the biomes that are down in St. Austell. So the university went down to the Eden Project in Cornwall and said, why don't you build another Eden Project in the North? And what about Morecambe? Well, Morecambe is a tiny seaside town that was a bustling seaside town during the Industrial Revolution, when it was viewed that this was a safe place and a good place for your health to come to for a holiday. And we said, can you imagine that if we were able to build an Eden in Morecambe, what we would be able to do with that? Now, we know that there will be at least a million tourists attracted to this facility on an annual basis. And that's really great because that's what persuades the government that this is an extremely important project to back. So it's partly government funded, but it will also be partly private funded. What's really interesting about it though, is the social and the civic work that is going on behind the screens. Now it's a coastal environment, as you can see. So we got the architects to build the buildings as if they looked like mussel shells, because it's mussels and cockles and other sorts of um, shells that were the, the lifeblood of the industry in this area over a hundred years ago. What we've introduced is something that's called the Morecambe Bay Curriculum. It's a 25 year educational program that is a commitment to every child in Morecambe that says we will take you from the moment you're born right the way through to your 25 when you're pretty much out of your university career and you're, you're living your own life we will hold your education all the way through and we will guide you over those chasms, which is where educational poverty starts. And by that, I mean the chasm between primary and secondary school. Those young people who don't get into the secondary school that they want feel that they're left behind. And our curriculum is going to make sure that we correct that. We also want to make sure that the curriculum helps in that chasm between secondary school and further education. Every child will carry a Morecambe passport and that passport will tell you what they've achieved. And we're not too worried about their English results or the mathematics results, but what we're really interested in was did, did they grow some carrots in, in a local um, plot? Were they able to sell those on to a local supplier? Did they go and clean up plastic on the beach? What was their role as a civic member of society from a very young age? making them feel committed to their place as if they belong and that they want to stay. And what we guarantee is that every child that has a Morecambe Bay curriculum will get uh, an interview for any post, or any job that is in the area. Doesn't mean that they will get it, but we guarantee they will have an interview. So the educational basis is right at the core of it. Research is incredibly important. We're on a most beautiful, coastal environment. So we will look at marine research, we will look at sustainability, we will look at green energy, we will look at health and well-being in all elements in which it manifests. And that ability to do baseline research that says here's what we have in an area of multiple deprivations. What happens when we introduce something like this? We create our own baseline and our own evidence. And engagement is right at the core of this. Engaging not just with the local communities, but engaging with national and international communities, whether in the research, the education, or in the fact of just simply tourism and general entertainment. But there is also an economic and regeneration aspect to it, because we want to be able to see the local communities starting to regenerate in terms of its own growth, starting the supply chains that will manage the area and the changes to the area, looking at the hospitality that will change in the area, bringing in businesses that are hotels and conference centres. And as you might expect in Markham, there's a huge cultural element, whether that is historical, whether it's arts based in terms of performance or in terms of fine arts. 
music is a huge responsibility in this area as well. So this is a civic project. It's a civic project that will be funded by our government, partly. It is very much based with the community. It's not doing something to the community. It's doing something with the community. And when the Eden trustee board visited, what they did was they took a photograph of the sunset on Morecambe Bay. And they put this photograph out onto social media. And they said, where in the world do you think we are? And all of the emails were coming back saying, you're in Rio de Janeiro, or you're in the south of France, or you're in Goa, and all these wonderfully exotic places. Nobody said Morecambe on the northwest coast of England, but they will because it's an area of natural beauty that lends itself to a spiritual and a civic experience that we are building right on our own doorsteps that has a local, a regional, a national and an international impact. So thank you for letting me share that with you this afternoon. And I'll hand it back to you now if I may. Thank you very much, Professor Blake, for sharing these insightful considerations with us. We'll certainly, uh, certainly have the opportunity to, to delve into some of these key issues during the second part of the webinar. So, so far, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Perez Lavi. Professor Lavi joined the Technion Rappaport Faculty of Medicine in 1975, where he served as dean from 1993 to 1999. In 2001, he was appointed as the Vice President of External Relations and Resource Development. And from 2009 to 2019, he served as a Technion President. Under his leadership, Technion stands among the top 100 world-class research universities, distinguished by academic excellence, interdisciplinary research strategy, innovative globalization and financial stability. Professor Lavi is considered one of the founders of sleep medicine, publishing more than 400 scientific articles and eight books in the field of sleep research and sleep disorders. Professor Lavi research has won many prizes, including the EMED Prize in Medicine 2006, the most prestigious prize for academic achievements in Israel. Professor Lavi, thank you again for accepting this challenge. And please, the virtual stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Much appreciate the opportunity to be here and to share with you some of my ideas regarding uh, universities as engines of economic development. And as you are going to, uh, realize, to find out, there are links between uh, my presentation and the presentation of Professor Black. By the way, I was sure that the uh, sunset was taken at Nazareth in Portugal, uh, which uh, <laughs> is also one of the most beautiful places I know. So uh, the question uh, of universities as uh, uh, engines of uh, economic development um, is a very important one. We are living in an area where economy uh, is based on knowledge and innovations and both knowledge and innovations uh, um, are linked very tightly with universities. Uh, the economic impact of universities evidence from across the globe is a paper published by uh, Valero and Rinin uh, in 2019. And it is, it is based on more than 15,000 universities in uh, 1500 regions in uh, more than 60 countries. And they, uh, after analyzing the data, they came to the conclusion that uh, increases in the number of, of universities are positively associated with uh, future growth of GDP per capita. And uh, the, the doubling of uh, number of universities per capita is associated with 4% higher future GDP per capita. And there is a positive spillover effects from universities to the uh, uh, close neighboring regions. And this is due to the fact that universities uh, increase the supply of human capital and more innovations to the region. Now, my question is, what are the necessary ingredients of a university in order to become an engine of economic development? 
And I'd like to uh, share with you my views about three issues, the mission of the university, research done by the university, and the education of the university. And in order to be an engine of uh, development, an engine of the economy, all three elements in a university makeup must be very well defined. A mission. Universities are uh, institutes that bring new knowledge. Uh, usually they are described in uh, uh, the media or in uh, uh, some uh, newspaper articles as ivory towers. The professors are um, standing uh, at the top of a tower and looking down on uh, um, you know, the rest of the population in a, some kind of uh, um, you know, remote, remote uh, uh, distance because they are uh, obliged to bring new knowledge. In order to uh, uh, make sure that the university is serving the community and the university is an engine of um, economy, uh, the mission of the university must be well-defined. And uh, it was a beautiful example by Professor Black how uh, Lancaster University uh, uh, made sure that uh, they contribute and interact with the environment. A university must define its mission. And the mission of a university is both to bring new knowledge and to serve the community. And uh, this has to be clearly stated in a mission statement of universities. Many universities focus and isolate themselves only to bring new knowledge to the world and they ignore their social responsibility. So a mission of a university is very important. Now, what about research? We usually define research or divide research into applied research and basic or practical research and fundamental research. Now, it's very interesting that in uh, many universities uh, conducting applied research or a use-oriented research, a research that is uh, uh, driven by a need to produce technology, to produce invention that will be put to use is considered to be a second-rate research. Only pure research or, or basic research is considered to be a, a research worth of academic promotion. This is something that has to be changed in order to make a university an engine for economic development. Both types of research must be uh, 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 appreciated, must be rewarded by academic promotion, must be rewarded by uh, um, uh, the academic community. It's very interesting that in the opening ceremony of the Technion uh, in 1924, during the keynote speech, uh, of uh, uh, a, a coal mining uh, engineer, his name was Osishkin, he started his speech with the following words, practical research and basic research are the two sides of the same coin. And I cannot agree with, 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 with it more. This is indeed how I would define the relationship between practical research and basic research. It is the same and uh, the only question is when basic research is going to be uh, uh, translated into practical research. Many of the new technologies, many of the what we enjoy today in our modern world start, started from basic research. And who could uh, believe that the basic research into protein degradation by two of my colleagues, uh, Professor Chikanover and Professor Hershko, who studied protein degradation with 20 years later will bring many, many cancer related drugs that help humanity. When they did their basic research, they didn't think about the application of the research. They did it because they were curious about protein degradation. Another issue is uh, uh, education. And education is very important. I believe that uh, education uh, uh, in universities, in most cases, provide students with tools to solve future problems. In many cases, future problems that we do not know exist today. But these are the focus of academic education. We ignore 
in many uh, universities what is called soft skills. I prefer to call them leadership skills. And these are the skills that are needed in order to deal with innovation, to deal with entrepreneurship, to make the university again an engine for economic development. And of course, the issue of meeting of minds that I'm going to discuss in a second. So problem solving skills, these are obvious. We have to provide deep understanding of issues related to uh, our problems, particularly in the engineering field, in the scientific field, how to solve problems and mathematics is important and physics is important, et cetera, et cetera. But the student must also be educated regarding teamwork. How do you work in a team? About creativity, what drive creativity, about work ethics, about interpersonal skills, about time management, how do you manage your time? What are the qualities of a leader? How to communicate, how to present a presentation? In many universities, we simply ignored these skills. They are called soft skills. We must provide students with these, what I call leadership skills. These are important and I'll just give you one example in the area of communication. How you present a clear presentation, how you stand with confidence in front of a group of uh, investors, how you uh, uh, show empathy to a, a lecturer, how you listen to a lecturer. What are the uh, um, characteristics of a verbal communication and nonverbal communication? How do you write a curriculum vita? How do you write a presentation? How you, do you write a proposal? How do you write uh, uh, for an investor a memo to convince him to invest in your startup? These are the issues that must be uh, uh, taught in a, a, a university that uh, is in, in, in a university that put as a mission to drive the economy forward. Meeting of minds. You know, creativity is a social process. The time that uh, uh, Archimedes was sitting in his bathtub and suddenly shouted, you wake up and uh, made a discovery is gone. Now creativity must uh, require interaction between people coming from different fields with different areas of knowledge, sometimes from different cultures or different institutes. And this interaction is crucial for the process of uh, 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 inventing and creativity. And a uh, meeting of minds can be done between students coming from different areas, uh, uh, engineers coming from uh, uh, electrical engineering and uh, medical students or uh, uh, chemistry students meeting with computer, uh, student, computer science students. Uh, meeting of minds can be done between students and faculty members. Uh, having a club of faculty members and students exchanging ideas. Uh, meeting of minds can be done between industry and students and between students coming from different cultures. These are also very, very important. And meeting of minds can be done informally and it can be done also in a formal education. For instance, studying in uh, the flipped class model is enhancing a uh, uh, meeting of minds. Uh, the student at home, uh, uh, see the video, uh, uh, get the basic lecture, and then in class is sitting in groups and discuss the ideas, try to get a deeper understanding of the concepts presented in the video at home. Uh, Problem-based learning, the same. Studio studies, and uh, we uh, implemented studio studies in our uh, new branch in New York. All studies, all education is done in a studio model in which people from different areas are sitting in the same place and discussing ideas. So meeting of minds can be done in a formal education and in informal education in order to really enhance the uh, uh, progress of creativity. And I'll give you one example where uh, a university was built with one purpose, to help the economy of a city. Um, in 2010, I got a letter from this person, uh, some of you may know him, uh, Michael Bloomberg, the mayor of New York. And he offered 55 universities to open in New York, a new university. And he said, 
This must be a game changer for New York City. I envy the Silicon Valley and Route 128 in Boston. I'd like New York to be the capital of technology. I must tell you, when I got the letter, I, I was very puzzled. I thought that somebody was pulling my leg, but then I found out that this is for real. And we prepare a program to open in New York City, together with Cornell University, a new university where the studies were tailor-made for the economy of New York. We opened a group dedicated to urban living. We had a group dedicated to uh, uh, the financial world. We had a group uh, dedicated to the media issues. Now, uh, the campus was built on Roosevelt Island. We got from the city uh, free land and uh, $100 million. And this is the campus. 2010, uh, Bloomberg's letter arrived. December 2011, we were announced as winners. And in September 2017, we inaugurated the campus. And you can see the campus. This is uh, on Roosevelt Island in uh, very close to Manhattan. It's interesting that uh, before we moved to the campus, before it was built, we started teaching at the headquarters of Google in uh, Manhattan. And when Eric Schmidt called me and invited me to start teaching in his headquarters, I asked him, why do you need us? He said, I'd like to be close to you. I'd like the interaction between your students, your faculty, and my people at Google. Meeting of minds. Now, uh, New York in March 2020 was announced as the second fastest growing innovation economy in the USA. Well, uh, this is not only because of Cornell Tech, because of our new campus, but what happened when we started the new campus, it became an attractor for talents from the entire uh, huge country like the US to come to New York for startup companies and it really ignited the economy of New York. So I truly believe that universities can be engines of economic development, but these universities must have certain characteristics that have to be very well defined in a mission, in research and in education. Thank you very, very much for inviting me uh, to this important uh, uh, students conference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor, for sharing with us these really insightful ideas and comprehensive analysis. And with these inspired presentations provided by our, our keynote speakers, we now conclude the first part of this webinar. But before we go to a short break, we'd like to share a video with you that envisioned a transformative process that is also taking place at Nova University Lisbon and the, under the project Smart Campus Living. We invite you to stay with us for the second part of the webinar, Innovation at Unica, and to submit your questions in the chat during the break. See you all in 10 minutes. Thank you so much. Bem-vindos ao novo Smart Campus Living Lab. O novo Smart Campus Living Lab é, antes do mais, um laboratório. É transformar todo este campo de campo lead da Universidade Nova num laboratório vivo para experimentação de novos serviços e novos produtos que tornem a vivência de espaços a melhor mais sustentável e um uso inteligente desse espaço. Potenciar o desenvolvimento da gestão do campus em geral, com uma plataforma aberta, baseada numa poderosa infraestrutura de armazenamento e computação, que forneça os recursos adequados para recolher, armazenar e processar os dados gerados pelos sensores, pessoas e sistemas, em múltiplos formatos e de múltiplas origens, internas e externas, para gestão de acessos ao campus e parqueamento, água, saneamento e espaços verdes, energia, resíduos e iluminação. A 
atuar com base no compromisso de colaboração e coordenação com os restantes agentes da área de gestão e tecnologias da informação para otimizar as capacidades existentes e formar uma oferta científico-tecnológica integral e de excelência que impulsiona a evolução da economia, incrementando o seu valor acrescentado. Apoiar o desenvolvimento de atividades de ensino, formação profissional e investigação, bem como a participação em ações de cooperação internacional nos vários domínios que integram os espaços inteligentes e sustentáveis. O Centro de Valorização e Transferência de Tecnologia Nova Smart Campus Living Lab é um polo para a criação de valor acrescentado e transferência de conhecimento na área de espaços inteligentes e sustentáveis. Um laboratório de experimentação e utilização de serviços inteligentes que favoreça a emergência de novos negócios e governo dos dados, aberto aos investigadores nacionais, internacionais e empresas. Nova Smart Campus Living Lab. O futuro começa aqui.
So welcome back to the second part of the experts webinar, Innovation at Unica. We'll now start our virtual roundtable with the presence of our two renowned keynote speakers. And to moderate this debate, we are, we are privileged to have our esteemed Vice Rector of Nova University, Lisbon. Professor Amar Matos has an extensive academic career, being a professor and a respectable scientist with a doctoral background in the fields of theoretical physics and economical sciences. But before handing the, of the floor over to our moderator, I'd like to encourage the audience to submit your questions in the, in the chat. They will be really appreciated. Thank you very much to all of you. Professor Amar Matos, the screen is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Gonçal, for giving me the screen, the whole screen, and keep my glasses. Uh, uh, I'm replacing my colleague, uh, Luis Batista, who was originally invited to moderate uh, discussion and debate. Uh, but um, I'm happy to do so uh, and to use this opportunity to, to share the discussion with uh, Peretz and Sue. Um, my first consideration, uh, having listened carefully to uh, both presentations is first to share with you that Nova University, Lisbon, it's Nova means new in Portuguese. And this university was created because there was already a traditional classic university in Lisbon called appropriately the University of Lisbon. Uh, and so Nova University of Lisbon was created <clears throat> with a very specific mission in the 70s to contribute to the development of the metropolitan area of Lisbon as opposed to the city of Lisbon, which is more concentrated and related to the University of Lisbon. And, and since its inception, our university was devoted to a civic mission just like Sue described it, because our role was to engage with the uh, metropolitan area of Lisbon. So we certainly resonate the presentation that Sue made <clears throat> regarding the civic contribution. We uh, establish ourselves as a global and civic university. This is our motto, right, in a sense. So this is clearly one of the main con considerations and concerns of our governance and the way we, we manage the university. Uh, regarding <coughs> the presentation of ferrets, I think it's it's quite interesting that <coughs> the focus on universities is breaking this ivory tower concept and getting more involved with society and generating creating value for society in the in the global and general sense is it, is quite uh, interesting as well, and we certainly share that idea. My considerations and my what I'd like to share with you is that when we live in the world of universities, and I'm addressing the students mainly, the young people that are young, at least as compared to me, uh, and in whom we deposit a lot of hope regarding what they're going to do with whatever they live and share with us, is that when I was young, I was told that universities have a main asset, and that asset is tradition and tradition and reputation and that they are intrinsically moved by you know, cultivating that reputation. And that reason, because universities, they live on the reputation that they build across times. Now, <clears throat> there are about 30,000 universities across the world currently, and of which 90% are not that old. They were created from the 20th century on. Sadly, what we notice is that in these young universities, and most of them are in capital cities, the old universities are actually located outside the big cities. So Cambridge, Oxford, you know, Princeton, they're outside the big main cities. The Technion is also outside the capital city. In, in the, but these new universities, they tend, sadly, to mimic and to aspire to be compared to the old universities. They don't actually live up to the challenge of being different and innovative in the way they act, unless the old traditional universities became equally innovative and then they are allowed to become uh, a mimic of their of, of the world. This is certainly not true for all universities. Some universities are, you know, 
they stand out for their capacity to be different, unique. But what I find that is very concerning is this inertial component of the behavior of, of, of universities. And I would like to ask you, Sue and Peretz, how do you see this and how does this inertia of the young universities compromise the capacity of universities to play the role as they should? That, that's my, my initial consideration, because I think that there is an institutional uh, obstacle to be as good as we should. So, shall I start? Um, I think, that's, I think that's very interesting what you've just said. And the whole reason of setting up new universities and certainly saw it throughout the UK was to try to respond differently. To say, we understand the Red Brick, the Ivy League, you know, that they have their reputations, but we need something with the energy and the drive. But unfortunately, when a mirror was held up, the reflection was to try to create something that mirrored what was already in existence. And in that, we lost so much opportunity across a number of the new universities. And so it was a real wasted opportunity of its time. I do think that there's starting to be a revolution amongst the universities, and I certainly see it within the UK. And part of that is about, you know, we all know governments come and governments go, and they all have whatever is, is their current drive. But at the moment, what we have in the UK is an understanding that if we are going to change the economy of the country, it cannot be at a sort of pan level that is a, 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 ver a version of vanilla or gray. It has to be something that really locks into an area, a place-based agenda where we know where the businesses are, where we know that they can expand what the skill sets are required. And that has probably only started to change in the last couple of years, but it's not just happening in the new universities. It's actually been gaining its momentum because it's happening in the red brick universities as well, because they've realized that if they're going to exploit what are the, the funding opportunities that are available for leveling up and place-based change, then they need to think differently as well. So for us, I think it's been quite helpful that, that there has been a drive right across the system rather than it being um, focused on just the new universities to break that mold. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I would start by saying that universities are uh, probably one of the most conservative institutes that exist. Uh, the universities and the church, any, any church, regardless of religion. And uh, I remember when I was a dean of medicine, I decided to change the curriculum of the faculty. And I started to read the literature about changing curricula of uh, medical schools. And I found out that it takes between three years and 11 years. Uh, well, again, and I wrote a paper about it even, that universities is like a medieval kingdom with uh, dukes and princes and everybody's keeping his territory and not giving up, etc., etc. I remember now when I started the uh, campus uh, uh, campaign to open our branch in New York, and this was a university that was really uh, invited by a city to help the economy. This was a completely new concept, completely new concept. And it took a while. This is why I emphasize the issue of a mission of a university. We take it for granted that universities have a mission. And usually you copy it from someplace and uh, you put it on your flag. This requires a process. It requires uh, some kind of uh, uh, a discussion. You have to get involved uh, from the assistant professors to the full professors. Mm -hmm. And it, it must be a process that uh, will uh, uh, conclude in a clear statement of mission. And I believe that if many universities would go through this process, then they can uh, detach themselves from the tradition and from the conservatism, et cetera. 
And uh, I, I, I went through this uh, process uh, several years ago uh, when I was a vice president. And now the mission statement is on the Senate wall and everybody can see it. And people, uh, 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 you know, sometimes even unconsciously, oh, but our mission is this and this and that. And I, this is why I recommend to many universities to go through this process. Define your mission, whether your mission is a civic engagement, whether your mission is to be an engine of economy or to be a pure knowledge uh, um, uh, developing university. You must define yourself. Thank you very much, Brett. It's certainly a matter not only of designing institutions, but leading with people. The institutions are made out of people and we need to, in, at the same time that we try to evolve the institution, we have to work with the people and changing mentalities and helping them actually entering the game as well. I do have two very interesting questions. Um, I'll ask the first one, then the second one will we'll, we'll take it on a, on, on a uh, second round because it's regarding education and technology. The first question is, do you think that comes from Ewan Ramsey? Uh, do you think that old universities, not being as innovative compared to more modern ones, is related to their aspirations to stay at the top of the league tables with published research, etc. In other words, do you think that this game is played for marketing rules and trying to attract more and more uh, students and researchers, keeping the reputation from the perspective of rankings and things like that? Is that what is happening when, you know, they didn't do what they're supposed to do? What do you think? So. Oh, you're very kind. Thank you, Paris. Um, I think I think there is a partial truth in that. I think there are some universities that are very league table focused, and then you become almost muscle bound by it. That it, it becomes your 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 raison d'être. There there is no no room for anything else. You must focus on these. But those who pay, or some who pay less attention to league tables, almost have a liberation that allows them to say, if I'm not constrained by being in the top, whatever it may be, maybe what I can do is something that is much more interesting, much more impactful, much more innovative. And if I fall out of the league tables, you know, so be it. But there is unfortunately a correlation between quality of students, quantity of students and league tables. And it's not just, it's about the universities feeding into that which in many ways is directed and led by our media who create these league tables. Even when you say don't create a league table, they, they, they create a league table of league tables and it becomes totally ludicrous. So if, if we could break that cycle, then I think we, we would be in a much better position. And I was very fortunate a couple of years ago to spend a couple of weeks in Israel going around a number of universities. And can I say, having my eyes opened about what innovation is like, what, um, you know, having a commitment to your dream is like. I came away learning so much from those two weeks, um, which was just a culture that was so alien to me. But then once you've seen it, you can never ever escape from it because it just becomes this halcyon and this dream that you think, if only we could do that. And there's a lot that we could learn from the Israeli universities in that. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I believe that uh, we, uh, particularly the media, gives to the issue of ranking uh, such a exaggerated place and importance that uh, um, there is no doubt in my mind that universities, many universities, are, are guided by the need to go up the league, up the table. And this uh, uh, sometime uh, dictate uh, type of research and type of uh, publications, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I truly believe that uh, some of these uh, uh, um, ranking games are uh, nonsense, in my opinion, mm. completely nonsense. And a university can change uh, 40 uh, uh, ranks because they lost one highly cited paper. Does it mean anything about the quality of the university? Nothing, uh, because particularly this researcher at that particular year was on sabbatical, so he didn't publish his highly cited paper. This uh, dropped the uh, university ranking 40 places, which is ridiculous. So I, there is 
uh, um, a bias toward universities which have many, many Nobel laureates, uh, 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 do basic research, et cetera, et cetera, and, and di direct their researchers toward the highly cited areas. And uh, I think that uh, part of it is us to be blamed because we take it into consideration. And I'm uh, on, on an advisory board of several universities uh, uh, to see that. And uh, part is the media, that we have to educate the media what is an important university. An important university is a university that brings to the region economic development, social engagement, uh, uh, um, uh, bring the level, uh, uh, the, the standard of living uh, uh, much higher, rather than publish again and again and again in nature or science. Peretz, uh, thank you very much for you and Peretz for your contributions to this question. I would like to challenge also the students because we should not forget that this is a webinar devoted to the students. And actually the, the whole argument is that students would pay more attention to rankings. That's why, you know, universities would fight so bravely for top positions in, in, in the charts. But I don't know whether the students nowadays, there is a responsibility on the side of students. What do they want from universities? What do they expect from universities? And given, you know, uh, Sue's presentation, Paris' presentation, I'd be quite interested in, in getting some questions from the students regarding whether it makes any sense at all to fight for top positions in, 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 in the rankings or not, given those considerations. But I wonder, has, I wonder uh, also as well, Joao, whether, um, you know, how much of the ranking matters to the students or how much of the ranking matters to their parents, parents. or their carers or their funders that's a very honest question. That That's a very honest question regarding who really finances the studies of the of, of the students. Let me go through a different question that Peria raised, and there, there's a question. Uh, I would like to ask something related to education methodology. As far as I'm concerned, non-formal education is one of the greatest tools we have in order to develop soft skills via learner-based methods. And I always consider that soft skills have nothing of soft about them really because right. they are really hard to develop. But my question is, is it even realistic to talk non-formal education in higher education institutions? Considering he, his own university classrooms are packed with 200 students sometimes. If not non-formal education, is there another strong tool to promote soft skills with that speed, with that level of efficiency, I assume? What do you first, think? I'm going to let you go first this time. Well, uh, there are many ways. Uh, indeed, uh, in a very tight curriculum and uh, loaded curriculum to add some more uh, uh, classes of uh, soft skills, etc., seems unrealistic. But uh, at least in my university, in the Technion, some of this uh, uh, education uh, for leadership skills are done informally. Some of them are done by the student union. They organize after classes, clubs, and uh, uh, bring uh, lectures and uh, bring uh, uh, um, experts in these soft skills. And many, many students flocked to these clubs and to these uh, 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 um, venues in order to be exposed to these uh, uh, issues. So students can be participating in uh, promoting uh, 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 leadership type of uh, qualities. A another venue is uh, campus-wide events. Once a year, there is the entrepreneurship day on campus with thousands of students. And you see uh, uh, students pick uh, uh, um, events that they would like to participate and some pick a meeting with successful entrepreneurs or share with them experience. Some are meeting with uh, uh, experts on communication skills or leadership skills, et cetera, et cetera. So you can promote uh, uh, this type of skills, not necessarily as part of the rigid curriculum, but in addition to the curriculum. And uh, in, in, in many universities, there is a minor. You can get a degree, let's say in electrical engineering, and you can get a minor in entrepreneurship, which provide you uh, with an extra education that will allow you to stand in uh, uh, a forum and present your idea in a clear and coherent way. Uh, uh, and these are skills that have to be, uh, I believe, uh, um, 
taught. Uh, you are not, not everybody is an expert on presenting his ideas. Uh, and I very, very much agree with everything that you said. The, these are not soft skills. These are really tough skills to be able to acquire and then to hone to a point that it, it, it becomes a, you know, an expertise of your own. We also um, are looking at some micro credentials throughout the courses that says, well, maybe you want to take a short course on public speaking or you know, something that, that takes you straight out of your comfort zone but allows you to, to explore different areas within your own curriculum. And the other thing that, that we do is, and I know this goes on in real universities, is in relation to volunteering. So volunteering to go out into charities, into businesses, taking your skills out into the real world and into the workplace, where there is that real exchange of knowledge, where you bring your expertise to that business, for example, but you're learning what it feels like to have that day-to-day -day job, to face those, those difficulties that a, a business owner is dealing with. And I talked very briefly about the More Convey curriculum and the fact that it runs 25 years from birth to 25. We started to do placements with businesses for children as young as five so that they go out and they know what it means when somebody in their community owns a business how difficult it is and what it feels like to go out and make a difference in the world. And I just think these soft skills are things that you learn continually throughout your life. And if we can introduce them at different points throughout a university experience, then so much the better. But they're not something that is constrained in one particular time scale or silo of your life. They are something that, it, that is a lifelong set of developing. One of the projects that uh, is very successful in the Technion is called BizTech. BizTech is a national competition in which we ask students to form groups of three, uh, uh, preferably students coming from different areas, and to write a business plan on one issue that has a national importance, climate issues, water issues, etc., etc. Out of 600 groups or 700 groups, we pick 100, they get training by alumni of the Technion who became entrepreneurs for three months. From this 100, we pick 30. They get three more months of training. And then we pick the last 10. And the best three getting seed money in order to apply their idea. And this is going on for more than 20 years, producing already several companies. But this is providing them uh, uh, informal training to become entrepreneurs with all the leadership skills that are needed in order to be a successful entrepreneur. This is organized outside the formal curriculum. It involves alumni of the Technion. It involves some of the faculty who have the fire in their belly to do it. It involves uh, uh, the student union and uh, 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 it gives uh, a lot of visibility to the issue of what we call startup nation. Uh, uh, this is one of the reasons of what we call Startup Nation. Yeah, uh, Ferret, and I think that just, you know, putting together what you both said, I think that there are two key ingredients to develop soft skills characteristics in our students. One is interdisciplinary, and you pointed that out very clearly, and the other one, Sue, you pointed out, but it's taken them out of their comfort zone. These two things together. This brings me, it's not only for students, even for researchers. I remember one responsible from the University of Louvain in Belgium that were, was describing the key activities of their interdisciplinary center. And she said that most, the key persons in their teams were the philosophers. And that actually was, was very curious. And the reason why philosophers were so key, it's because they deconstruct the language. And that explains exactly what the problem is. People, when they interact, they use different languages, different concepts. And you need someone who stop, who breaks the speech and asks, no, no, stop. Explain exactly what you mean with this or this expression. Can you please deconstruct that so that I can understand? And that kind of exercise, takes you out of your comfort zone, which is your code, your mechanism, and, and forces you to dialogue with the others. I think that what we lack tremendously nowadays is this capacity to dialogue and to understand other people's views and points of view. And I think that 
whatever you say and the examples that you both gave that you're familiar with and that we also have here in Lisbon uh, actually boil down to this very quintessential need of human beings to dialogue and to understand each other. And much more terrifying than that, we have um, a group that is called Bright Club and Bright Club is stand-up comedy. And so we have our researchers and our teachers putting themselves on the stage and literally having to make an audience laugh. Now that, that to me is the most terrifying thing on the planet, but they learn about confidence. They learn about the ability to communicate. They learn how to read an audience. Um, for me, it, it's a real baptism of fire, I would say. But the, when, when they finally got over those, those nerves and that terrifying moment, they say, you know, they really learned so much about what they were then able to do that they never ever thought they could. That outside the comfort zone is really important. My key question to the students is if when they come to university, is that what they are expecting from the university? Is that what they are eager to learn from the university as well? Is it part of the package they're expecting or not? Because I don't think it is in general. And, and, and that, that opens, a, you know, field for conversation. I have another question that I find quite interesting from Maria Khodorovska. Uh, and she asks, do you really believe that economic development is first and foremost precondition for transforming universities? What are the other factors needed to build a high quality environment for sharing the knowledge and making the people conscious about connected local and global issues in today's world? Uh, that's a really interesting question and thank you for it, Maria. Um, in many ways, economic development or regeneration or growth is where we want to get to. To me, it's not the, the, the reason to be. We want to be able to increase people's opportunities. So that might be that we need to inc in, increase the quality of their housing. If you live in appalling housing, it's difficult to reach your potential. We have in a, a little town not far from here, which is Morecambe that you saw, one in every four children in Morecambe rely on a food bank in that year because their families have got such levels of deprivation. Now, if you have children who don't know where their food is coming from, they don't know whether they're going to be in secure accommodation that feels like home to them, then they're not going to worry about economic regeneration. But if we can help to educate that child, house that child and feed that child, we get them to a position where they are able to play their part in that economic regeneration, which is important. But it's not the reason for everything. You've got to address the underlying problems before you get there. And the whole societal involvement, I think, is, is, is interlinked. They're, they're not separate things. It's a very rich ecosystem and tapestry, but if you can't meet the basics, which is safety, you know, a roof over your head and food in your stomach, then, you know, economic regeneration is not going to happen. So therefore it can't be your first drive. Well, I agree. Um, again, uh, looking back why my university was established, uh, the Technion, the Technion uh, idea came uh, at the end of the 19th century in order to provide education to Jewish people that uh, it was deprived of, uh, they were deprived of academic education in, at that time in Europe, particularly in engineering. So the idea was to open a Jewish university in uh, Palestine at the time that was under the Ottoman Empire in order to provide the education. Uh, by the way, uh, the decision was to open a technological institute because if one day there is going to be a Jewish homeland, somebody must build it and you need engineers in order to do it. And this has become part of the DNA of the Technio, service, uh, uh, providing service in addition to gaining knowledge. And this is why I say that these are the two sides of the same coin. And this has uh, accompanied the development of the university. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, we just published a, a short note in, in Nature last, last year what we deal, how we dealt with minorities in the Technion. When I became a vice president, 7% of our students were from the Arab sector. Dropout rate was 70% after first year. Uh, now, 
23% of our students come from the Arab sector, and the dropout rate is the same as uh, the general population in the Technion. And we did it by a structured program. We decided that we have to uh, uh, make sure that the students from the Arab sector get uh, um, uh, enhanced education in order to allow them to overcome the very tough requirements of the Technion without any uh, allowances. They were accepted as regular students, but we gave them uh, uh, much more help throughout the way in order to allow them to overcome the, what we call the bump of the first year, which is the most difficult one. But this is an example of how a university decided to take one sector of society in order to bring it forward and uh, by the way, it's very interesting. From the Arab sector, we have more women than men studying in a technological institute. I don't believe there is any example, any other example, any place in the world uh, for such a uh, uh, gender bias toward women studying in a technological institute. So I fully agree universities should have a social mission and should take it into consideration that uh, society uh, uh, is financing us and we have to give back. Thank you very much, Gerrit and Sue, once again, for these uh, insights. I think that uh, our time is coming to an end as well, because uh, a webinar is a webinar. And there is this much we can, we can do about the questions and the, uh, the time online, because I think that one of the things that we learned with the online system is that it should be enough <laughs> right there is a point but uh, i think that gonzal asked uh, each of you to prepare perhaps a suggestion uh, a final suggestion to close this discussion i don't know an idea a book a reading uh, a movie i don't know so i would i would i would give the floor to see perhaps to close uh, participation here so i i took it very literally and um one of the most influential books that, have, that has, uh, has really impacted on my life is by the ex-bishop of Edinburgh. His name is Richard Holloway. And Richard Holloway wrote the most beautiful book called Waiting for the Last Bus. And it's, it's a reflection on the fact that however long we live, our lives are short. And if we spend all of our time worrying about tomorrow, then what we don't reap are the benefits of today. And, and for me, it's a real mantra of change of lifestyle, is to live in the present, not to live for the future. And I think that transcends right the way across, certainly how I feel life should be geared. And as a forensic scientist, which is what I am, trust me, I do know that life can be very, very short. Well, uh, I, I will much. be complimented to Sue by being more practical. I'm holding in my book, and uh, I'm holding a new book that just came out, Universities as Engines of Economic Development. By the way, I thought Fair about enough. the title of my presentation before the book came out. So I, I was very it was very gratifying to see the title of the book. The senior uh, uh, author is Ed Crawley uh, from MIT. And I suggest the students uh, to read it and also to introduce the book in the university because it provides some uh, uh, practical guidelines how to really change the university into an uh, uh, engine uh, for uh, regional development, economic development. And it provides 40 examples of universities that have elements that support uh, 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 what uh, uh, the titles say. And I would like en to encourage the students, take initiative, be active, do something on your own in order to promote this dialogue uh, uh, and uh, meeting of minds and uh, 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 enhancement of uh, education in leadership uh, 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 roles. I think this is something that can be done by students. Uh, uh, I'm sure that once you start it, you'll get all the help from the university. And um, I'm ready to write to your president and encourage him to support you and provide you with a budget to do it if you want. Thank you so much. This was fascinating. Thank you very much, Peretz. So the lessons we take from here, it's universities as economic engines, 
in the present. <laughs> As she would point out, it was my privilege to share the screen with these two people I look upon very seriously and I admire, and I hope to keep calling friends. Thank you so much indeed. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Amard Matos, Professor Blake, Professor Labi. We certainly have a lot to think about when we this webinar. And with this important reflection concerning the transformative process of higher education institutions, we have reached the end of our webinar. A final word to warmly thank you all on behalf of Nova University Lisbon and UNICA for everyone presence. I hope you can leave here today with new angles and new questions to support your preparatory work for the final conference. And before closing the webinar, I believe UNICA will have